Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining the Bipartisan Policy Center for this first in a series of events focusing on the state of America's housing supply. I'm Dennis Shea, the Executive Director of the J. Ronald Twilliger Center for Housing Policy, which we launched here at the BPC this past September. The center was founded to advance the goal of realizing a decent, safe, and affordable home for every American family. Unfortunately, securing affordable housing remains a struggle for far too many. The lack of available affordable homes nationwide drives up prices for renters and homeowners alike, leading to unsustainable cost burdens while hampering the ability of families to build wealth over time. The nation's housing shortage has continually worsened since the early 2000s with new housing production lagging behind population growth. Persistent underbuilding over the past two decade, decades has led to a shortage of approximately 6 million housing units, according to a study recently commissioned by the National Association of Realtors. Every state in the country is impacted by this imbalance between supply and demand. This is truly a national problem. To help us understand the scope and underlying causes of the housing supply shortage, we are pleased to be joined by a team of experts with extensive experience across the industry and in government. But before we go to our panel, I want to hand it over to Sam Cater, Vice President and Chief Economist at Freddie Mac, who will provide us an overview of the housing supply challenge while highlighting recent economic trends and forecasts for the coming year. Thank you for joining us, Sam. Uh, it's great to see you on screen, and I'll kick it over to you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. I'm delighted to be with you all today. I'd like to thank Dennis and Andy for the um, uh, invite. I've got about a dozen slides that should appear on your screen in a moment uh, that will outline the scale of the shortage and the downstream uh, impacts that it has. And there are, are many intertwined um, Impact. So let's start with the, the basics. The number of homes for sale on the market today is uh, at or near our record lows. Historically, the number of homes uh, for sale uh, in the market were anywhere between two and a half to three million homes. And you can see on your screen that uh, the inventory uh, typically rises uh, and contracts with the economic expansion that happened during the 1980s, during the 1990s. And then especially uh, during the mid 2000s, uh, during the historic um, housing production uh, boom. What's interesting is after the last boom, we never really had a, um, a recovery in the expansion of, uh, of, uh, of production like we have had in other cycles. And moreover, when the pandemic began, uh, as you can see on your screen, uh, the inventory really fell off due to the uh, historic low rates, pandemic driven uh, demand to the suburbs and across other cities, which I'll uh, talk about um, uh, in a moment. When we look at housing production, so we, you know, why, we, why do we have this sh uh, shortage? And, and there are many uh, reasons, but, but first, you know, the, the main reason is the lack of housing uh, production in the US. If we go back to the late 1960s here on this chart, I plotted the number of annual housing completions um, in the US. And again, it, it, it shows just like the inventory, uh, uh, you know, the real estate cycle is the business cycle. And um, when the economy is doing well, you get an uh, rise in, in, in production. And then when the economy hits a recession, uh, which is indicated by the blue bars in the early 80s and the early 1990s, uh, the production uh, uh, contracts. If you take a look at the last 10 years, uh, we have been building, uh, you know, in the recession in 09 and, and, and 2010, we hit historic lows in terms of uh, housing production. But even in the expansion, uh, which was uh, about nine years or so until this uh, most recent uh, recession last year, we were still building at uh, recession levels. And we are currently running at about 1.4 million in terms of uh, production when we should be at about 1.6 or 1.7 or so. That gap of you know, a couple hundred thousand, 300,000 units uh, doesn't sound uh, like a lot, but on a cumulative basis, uh, it really adds up uh, in a material way. And uh, not only are we not building enough overall housing, but we're not building 
uh, enough of the uh, mosaic of different housing types. If you look at, uh, uh, for example, manufactured housing, modular housing, duplexes, triplexes, quads, uh, the number of homes produced uh, in the, each of those segments has, uh, has declined uh, uh, precipitously. If we look at one aspect of, of that uh, segment, which is the entry level uh, supply, uh, that's declined uh, uh, by about a quarter. Here, what I've plotted first is the, the dark blue line. This is census data, which uh, charts the share of single family construction that's less, uh, that's at or below 1400 uh, square feet, which has been traditionally the kind of entry level home in the US up until the last couple of decades where, where housing really uh, sort of the average size really began to uh, become uh, larger. The problem with the census data is it only goes back to 1976. And what's interesting about the, the blue line here is I actually had to go into old PDFs and hand uh, transcribe some of that data because it's not available like electronically. So we went to the public records, which we have access to. This is parcel level data for over 140 million um, uh, 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 structures in residential structures um, in the US. And then we looked at the, the year that the home was built and we created a time series out of that. And that matched up very nicely with the census data. And so um, uh, uh, because we were very comfortable with that, we, we could go back much further in time than we could with the census data, A, and then we can look at certain states or we can even go down to you know, municipalities. I won't do that here. I'll, I'll show you a few states after this. But what this shows is that uh, back to the 1940s, uh, more than half of all homes were entry uh, level and we've seen a monotonic decline uh, since then, in the 1970s, we were producing about 400 to 450,000 entry level units. In the last uh, three or four years, it's been below 100,000. So we've, we've fallen to a quarter of what we used to supply. In the meantime, um, while the focus of this presentation is on supply, I want to give you a couple of metrics on uh, demand. When we look at uh, the share of uh, Freddie Mac mortgages that are going to uh, first time home buyers, they are running uh, at about 45%. Historically, that share has been about uh, 30%. When we look at the number of first-time home buyers that we financed uh, on a year-to-date basis for 2021 that we estimate for the full year, running at about 550K uh, first-time home buyers just for Freddie's uh, uh, flow, the purchase flow. When we go back to 2015, it's under 250,000. So the number of first-time home buyers that have come in the market through Freddie Mac's uh, purchase programs has doubled. And I think this just reflects the market as a whole. If you look at uh, millennials, um, millennials are by far the largest uh, age cohort in, in the U.S. The peak, the, the largest single age cohorts in the U.S. are 29, 30, 31 year olds. There's between four and a half to about 4.8 million in each of those um, segments. And they're all reaching the first time home buyer age. And so demand is absolutely booming. And when you consider that entry level demand is booming and you put it in context of entry level supply, which is declining, you get a massive run up. And, uh, and home prices that I'll come, and I'll come back to in, in a minute. What's interesting about the entry level shortage is it's happening across every single state in the US. Here I've plotted uh, California, Florida, New York, and Texas, and looked at the entry level share. And you can see that they're all, all declining. And in fact, we've run charts for every state in the US, even the most rural states uh, in the US, you know, Montana, Iowa, places like that. Um, uh, they're all seeing the same declines. It doesn't matter what state, uh, uh, you are, and you can see California is the lowest on 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 this uh, this particular chart, but it's happening across the U.S., which surprised me. I didn't. I thought it would be more, much more pronounced in the more dense places, but this is really happening also in the least dense uh, places um, in the U.S. Uh, a few years ago, about three years ago, we estimated the shortage uh, uh, in the U.S. of of the supply of homes. This was in in 2018, and we created this methodology where we looked at. Uh, what we created sort of a target household rate and a target vacancy uh, uh, rate to estimate the number of vacant units, uh, which will help us lead to the number of housing units that's needed for the U.S. To, so to just go through that very quickly, in terms of households, we uh, uh, ran a regression where we looked, we tried to estimate what the headship rate should be, uh, given the age structure of the U.S., um, the incomes of folks and the way the economy uh, is, is performing at the time. And that gave us what, what the number of households should be uh, relative to where they are. And then we estimated the long-term vacancy rate to give us the number of units that's needed for a well-functioning market. That gave us the number of house, total number of housing stock uh, uh, that we needed 
um, in 2018, which was the which is the 140.8 versus the 138 million uh, actual housing units. That gave us a gap of about two and a half million in, in 2018. When we ran those same regressions in uh, 2020, uh, we came up with a gap of uh, 3.8 uh, uh, million. And and keep in mind that was uh, you know the data then was for uh, 2020. A lot of that doesn't, you know, this data uh, requires a lot of census data, which does not uh, factor in the pandemic. And the shortage since then has obviously increased uh, because the supply has just dramatically fell, fallen since then. So I would expect if we ran this today, this would be, you know, well over four and a half to possibly close to five million um, units or so. And in fact, if you look at uh, uh, other estimates of shortages, NAR, the National Association of Realtors has come up with an estimate of five and a half million. The uh, 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 National Low Income Housing Coalition has come up with an estimate of 6.8 million. What's interesting, very interesting, is uh, very recently in the past few months, uh, the uh, uh, very well known uh, uh, and highly uh, respected uh, uh, builder consultants have come up uh, with uh, analysis that reveals that they believe the market is either balanced or maybe even uh, overbuilt. And it's actually really interesting. And, and uh, the main reason that they come up with these conclusions very broadly is that they are looking at the new construction market. And when you look at the new construction market and you look at the invert inventory to sales ratios, uh, they are running at about six months supply or so. Um, that's about normal. Uh, the, the overwhelming majority of the shortage is in the resale market. The resale market accounts for about 85% of all sales. So when they're looking at the 15% slice of the new construction market, they're saying that market is, is, is well supplied. Uh, my sort of response to that is that the builders are building premium homes um, to affluent consumers um, and they're matching that demand. However, that only accounts for a very small segment of, uh, of the market. My concern is that many of the, the, the builders are not going to continue to ramp up their production. I, I will say, you know, another reason that the builders point out to the fact that they think the market's balanced or maybe even overbuilt is the pipeline of homes that are under construction is large, but it's nowhere near or anywhere near the shortage that we're seeing uh, in the market. It's much needed and will be coming slowly onto the market, but it will be easily absorbed uh, into the market given uh, uh, trends uh, today. Uh, and let me just sort of rewind my slides. Okay, so let's talk about impacts. I'll go very quickly. So the first obvious impact is that uh, the entry level shortage and the supply shortage leads to a, a, a boom in home prices. Home prices uh, in our index reached 20% on a year over year uh, 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 basis a couple of months ago. It's very modestly decelerated um, uh, since then. So that's that's a new record high. Uh, I've got some charts later on geography that just sort of shows you uh, the regional distribution. Uh, when you when you break out um, the um, the differences between uh, entry level home price appreciation and luxury home price appreciation, huge differences. So here I've plotted the CoreLogic home price index, and the lower tier is the the bottom part of that uh, the 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 two lines that make up sort of the area going up. And so if you look at uh, entry level home prices, uh, they have uh, 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 increased about two hundred and eighty five percent or so over the last. Uh, 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 two decades um, versus the uh, luxury tier, which is appreciated much less. And, and if you look at that gap, and I've got, and it's really hard to see on the screen, but when you look at the gap between luxury price uh, price growth and entry level price growth, it's about 59%. So, so the fact that there's more supply on the high end by the builders, the fact that there's more supply has led to a much more muted response in home prices, which makes sense that there's, you know, there's a more balance in the, uh, in the luxury home segment. And so uh, therefore you get lower uh, uh, price uh, appreciation. So bottom line, there's this very large and emerging affordability gap. And this is, you know, here I, I started this chart in, two, in January of 2000, but you can make the same chart and show this trend become even wider if you go further back uh, in, in time. Um, the, uh, you know, another the second impact in terms of the Supply shortage is that renters are scrambling for a shrinking set of inventory. Per my comment about the very large and historic wave of first-time home buyers, here we've plotted the number of renter households per home available for sale. Historically, that share between about 10 and 18 uh, or so recently arose to the mid-30s, and it remains very elevated. So there is basically a frenetic uh, pace of activity by 
uh, renters, and we see this in pricing uh, in pricing pressures. The, the percentage of homes that sell in under three days or the percent of homes that sell above listings are at record high, much, much higher than the mid-2000s. Uh, in fact, it's not even close. It's, it's more than double. The pricing pressure is just much, much higher. Uh, so the velocity of home sales um, is, is, is very fast. Um, and, you know, third impact um, is that older, uh, because there's not enough inventory, uh, older, more affordable homes are quote unquote filtering up. They're being rated by higher income households that cannot find the housing stock that, that they're looking for. This is related to the gentrification comment, but it's, it's, it's different because here, uh, uh, these more affluent homeowners are rating uh, older homes irrespective of where they are in the metro area. Uh, so they'll go in, purchase the home, uh, do a heavy renovation, gut renovation, um, and, and it leads to a filtering up. So what is filtering up uh, or filtering down? I mean, historically, when the builders have built uh, the home, um, the flow of incomes that proceed through those homes decline over time as the, as the home ages. Um, um, and, so the, and so what we did here on the left-hand side, it's actually really interesting. There's a paper out, this, uh, out there that's public um, um, where we took a look at the Freddie uh, Mac homes that we have purchased over the past few decades. And we created a repeat income index. Basically, we looked at the flow of incomes through the same home over time. So if a home was purchased in 1980 and it was new, we recorded what the income was uh, then. And then the next time it sold, let's say in 1990, we, looked, we took a look at the income in 1990 and then again in 2000 or wherever, whenever it's transacted. And we chain those transactions together uh, for the same home. And then we look at the income, the flow of income to these properties and adjust it for inflation. That's the chart on, that you get on, on your left. And so what that means as, an, as a home ages historically, um, uh, it has filtered down to more affordable, uh, to lower income uh, folks uh, on the tune of about 15 of a 15% decline. However, uh, particularly over the last few years, they've begun to uh, accelerate up and filter back up because they're being rated by higher income households than historic, uh, historically has been the case. On the right-hand side, we've taken that same uh, uh, Freddie Mac data where we chain the flow of incomes over time and we've plotted it for a variety of markets. And you can see the hot markets are not filtering down at all. They're just filtering up. Uh, these are markets like LA um, and, and DC. Uh, the markets where uh, there's a sort of a structural stagnation in the economy has, has led to the filtering phenomena like a Detroit, which is, is what theory would sort of suggest is the case. These older homes um, uh, where they may not have the, um, the home improvement that's needed. Um, they may not have the right size for, uh, uh, for the today's home buyers. And so they're just not in as, as hot demand. And so they filter down to, uh, to uh, lower or moderate income households. So that, this filtering down phenomenon is still happening in cities that have weak demand, uh, like a Detroit or like a, a, a Chicago. But in any of the hot markets, they're not filtering down at all. In fact, they're just uh, uh, filtering up. And, um, and so uh, what, does this, what does this mean? So if, if, uh, if uh, households uh, cannot find the home in their market, it's, this causes kind of several, several cascading issues. A, a potential home, uh, home buyer will uh, remain a renter. Uh, in some cases, they might not even form a household at all. In fact, we know for many millennials, the share of millennials living with their parents has risen. Um, if they can't uh, find a home further out in the suburb, which was happening pre-pandemic and has really accelerated since then, there was this sorting effect that's happening in, in many across uh, US cities where um, uh, lower income folks in order to afford are moving further and further out uh, into the suburb. And so it's causing American cities to begin to look very similar to their uh, European uh, counterparts where you have a larger share of lower income um, people that are sorting out to the suburbs and living uh, in the suburbs. And if they can't afford out there, then they move across markets, which is what's on your screen here. So what we've done here is use Freddie Mac's data to get a real-time view of migration of home buyers, because we know what their, uh, the address of the new home that they just purchased, and we know the address of the old home that they purchased. And so we can track their migration in, in, um, in real time. And so on the left-hand uh, chart here, I plotted the mig net migration in New York, LA, San Francisco, DC, and Miami. Uh, historically, it's been negative, i.e. more and more people are leaving these expensive uh, cities. Um, but when the pandemic began, the bottom fell out in these markets where you see a, a very large number of, um, 
uh, households leaving these markets and looking to buy anywhere outside of those uh, markets. This has been very well known in the press. They've uh, provided many anecdotes on it. The nice thing about this data is we can look at it in, in real time. What is interesting, uh, even though the left chart is sort of known anecdotally, on the right hand side, I think is not well known at all. Uh, in fact, this was a uh, real surprise to us. When we look at net migration and sort of the hip uh, markets that have been very popular over the past decade, these include uh, Denver, Salt Lake City, uh, Austin, Texas, Nashville, and, and Raleigh. They historically had been uh, experiencing positive in migration, uh, but notice what happened in 2017 and 2018 as those markets became less and less expensive um, and, be and became less affordable. They were really beginning to get affordability issues. They started to lose people. So these are the popular cities in the US that are, have been gaining people the last few decades. Uh, they began to lose people before the, the recession. Uh, but once the pandemic hit, they, they began to behave like, you know, households began to behave in these cities like they do in the unaffordable, very unaffordable gateway cities. They're leaving them in droves. Keep in mind, these numbers are, are not large, but I think the trend is really, really indicative of, of home buyer sentiment and that even these markets, which uh, are very strong from an economic and cultural and employment base and very attractive overall, but they're really losing uh, folks because they've become uh, too expensive. Here we've plotted all that data to show you, uh, to get a sense of uh, what the migration picture looks like over the last two years. And that the blue circles, the blue filled in circles are uh, places that were gaining uh, internal mi uh, 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 domestic migration pre-pandemic. The yellow circle is uh, filled in circle is post positive post-pandemic migration. The empty white circles uh, are ones where uh, uh, places have been losing um, uh, households. So we've had net out migration. And in all of these places, really, the migration, the pandemic, all the pandemic did was really accelerate pre-existing um, trends. It's initiated some new trends, but it's, it's really what it's done is just pour gasoline on pre-existing trends. And so you can see in LA, San Francisco, San Diego, up, all up and down the Western coast, the lar all the large unaffordable markets losing people. Those are the empty white circles. Where they're going, they're going to the Central Valley of California, the Southwest, into Phoenix, and into Vegas, and into, into Reno, into Idaho, which is the hottest uh, home price market um, out there, uh, all over the uh, uh, Texas, in, but in particular, um, Austin. Look at Florida. Florida is just booming from a migration perspective. And same with the Carolinas, both North Carolina and South Carolina, huge, huge um, uh, growth. What's also interesting is you just see all over through the South and even some of the Midwestern, some of these smaller legacy markets. Uh, these smaller uh, filled in circles where you see just migration just dotting the American landscape, basically anywhere outside an unaffordable um, gateway market. And if you were, if you will just sort of imprint this map in, in your mind right now, I'm going to move to a home price map that's basically going to show you the same exact uh, pattern. So here we've plotted uh, home price growth over the last year. What are the hottest markets? It's all the markets where people are moving to uh, the Rocky Open West, Idaho, uh, Montana, Idaho is the hottest market uh, uh, right now. You've got some markets that are uh, getting year over year appreciation between mid thirties and close to 40%. That is extremely, extremely high on par with the hottest, um, uh, the fastest amount of growth of any market in the history of the US history, meaning the last 50 years or so where, where we have um, um, data. And then take a look at the Southwest, which is also hot, uh, Texas, uh, the Carolinas, and, and even into the sort of um, uh, Tennessee and, and Northern Georgia. And then, and then uh, Florida is absolutely uh, red hot. And so when we look at, uh, and instead of sort of providing a summary, I wanted to kind of provide some closing thoughts on the implications. So we're seeing uh, strong demographic growth uh, and pandemic uh, demand uh, in context of a structural decline in entry level supply, which has led to a record home price boom. Uh, large number of vendors are scrambling for shrinking uh, inventory. Um, the, I didn't mention the third point because I just think it's, uh, it, it's sort of a topic on its own. Inflation is front and center in today's uh, policy uh, discussions. If you look at the single biggest uh, component of inflation, it's shelter. And home price inflation is at uh, record high. Single family rent inflation, record high. Multifamily rent inflation is at a record high. So this means the biggest component of inflation is growing very rapidly and will continue to grow over the next year because of the way it's constructed, unlike the, uh, the um, price index of other goods, the way it's measured for shelter, it, it functions with about a year lag. And so we're see, we will see the record home price and record rent growth of the past year show up in inflation uh, over the next 12 months or so. So the fact that we're not building enough homes 
all things equal means more inflation. It also means lower household formations, which I discussed before, lower home ownership rates for uh, young, uh, young adults. Uh, a key point, uh, much lower lifetime wealth accumulation and higher wealth inequality. These uh, households that eventually become homeowners, homeowners, the ones that are successful <laughs> and become homeowners, um, because they are uh, in their uh, tenure much uh, shorter than they would otherwise be, their wealth accumulation is, is, is much less. And home equity accounts for the bulk of wealth for the overwhelming majority of, uh, of Americans. It's really not until you get into the, about the top five to 10% of the income um, distribution where uh, uh, non-housing wealth becomes the, the biggest uh, wealth component. This could be stocks or business equity. Uh, older affordable homes are filtering up uh, because they are being rated by higher income households due to the shortage. First time buyers are moving further out or across other cities. Uh, and lastly, um, and this is again, another policy point, we're seeing migration uh, to affordable cities, and this has implications for economic growth and productivity. There's some papers that indi indicate that the most productive cities are the ones that are the richest and have the highest incomes. These are you know, New York, DC, LA, San Francisco, places like that. And if people move away from these cities that are the most productive and move to other cities that are less productive, this has implications for economic growth and productivity. So the lack of, to sum up uh, overall, the lack of, um, uh, entry level supply and the, the housing shortage has a lot of implications that are downstream that I think we have to think about. And there are actually some others that I've been thinking about that I'd love to uh, also uh, share as well. So with that, I'll now turn it over to, to Dennis. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, Sam, for that uh, very informative presentation. And if I'm not mistaken, we're going to have those uh, slides on the BPC website uh, for our viewers to, to have access to. Also like to note that we have viewers from Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, Wyoming, Ohio, Rhode Island, which shows you the breadth of uh, interest uh, in this topic. It's truly a, a national uh, concern. So now it's my privilege to uh, welcome three additional speakers to this discussion, all members of uh, BPC's Housing Council, a group of experts convened at the beginning of this year. Uh, first, I want to welcome uh, Dana Wade, a former HUD Assistant Secretary for Housing, also known as the FHA Commissioner, Commish, and the uh, current uh, production officer at uh, Walker Dunlop, uh, the largest provider of capital in the multifamily industry in, in the United States. Thank you. Uh, we're it's also a pleasure to be here. Great to see you, Dana, even though, even virtually. Um, we are also thrilled to have uh, Ismael Guerrero, uh, President and CEO of Mercy Housing, uh, one of the nation's leading affordable housing organizations, really a great organization. Uh, in a prior life, Ismael uh, served as Executive Director of the Denver Housing Authority. And finally, we, we are really pleased to have with us Brian Green, who is the former HUD uh, General Deputy Assistant Secretary and current Vice President uh, for Public Policy Policy Advocacy at the National Association of Realtors. And I just wanna thank all of you for, for being here with us uh, today. Uh, before we dive into our discussion, a quick reminder uh, to our audience that if you have questions for our panelists, which we hope you do, uh, you can tweet them to uh, at BPC underscore bipartisan. I'll repeat that, at BPC underscore bipartisan. You can do that throughout the webinar using the hashtag BPC Live. Uh, you are also welcome to submit your questions uh, in the YouTube chat, and we hope to get to some of those questions later in the hour. With, with that, I just want to do a quick follow-up for Sam and uh, then get to the panelists. Uh, Sam, are, are there any communities that you have uh, examined uh, throughout the United States that are bucking national trends uh, making the changes necessary for, for housing supply to keep pace with job growth and uh, population growth? Uh, yeah, they are uh, uh, actually. Uh, so if you look at, uh, you know, um, markets such as Portland and Minneapolis, which has, which have uh, upzoned uh, in order to deal uh, with the increasing uh, demand. And, and, you know, the basic purpose of upzoning is, to, uh, is really to provide more density. Uh, for uh, these markets, and, and it's really just a modest amount of gentle density that you need to, to in order to meet the uh, uh, demand. And, and they've also not just um, 
up, up zoned on single family, but really the, to increase density, but to also increase the, the, diff, the, the mosaic and different types of housing that are really uh, uh, needed uh, for, the, for the market. Uh, and there are also some cities which are sort of more uh, pro-growth. They tend to be in the South and Southwest. Um, and, um, but, but the problem is, is due to the migration, the, the, the migration has really poured gasoline on this and is, and is causing many of these smaller markets to become overwhelmed by the demand from the coast. It doesn't take much of an uh, outflow. If we look at our migration data that the number one inbound uh, migration market is Riverside. And there's sort of a, mm. a, a stream of home buyers coming straight out of LA right into, into Riverside. And it's really overwhelmed Riverside's uh, uh, housing market. And so, and so while some communities are, are trying to address the increase in demand, the migration has really made it even more difficult. Um, so I, you know, I almost view the, the lack of production as, as pollution, right? It's an externality uh, that is spilling over into other markets um, mm -hmm. and, and causing affordability issues. Thank you for that. I'm gonna just turn it over to, to Brian, ask Brian a question. Um, uh, Sam cited the realtor statistic uh, in his presentation, and it seems to you seem to have a slightly different numbers. Uh, I think Sam has a lower number than the realtors. Just to remind the audience, uh, the realtors recently projected the U.S. would need to build more than two million homes annually over the next uh, ten years to close our underbuilding gap, under building gap of about five point five to six point eight million million homes. And to do that, that's a lot higher than the current rate of production of about 1.3 to 1.4 million homes per year. So, so Brian, in your view, what do you think, what would it take to make that, that feasible, to make that possible? Well, um, certainly uh, raising the alarm bells with policymakers as, as you're doing here. And uh, Dennis, I want to thank you also for uh, coming to NAR. Uh, to speak on this important subject. I got to ask you the questions then. Uh, now you are getting your revenge. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, um, you know, you know, regardless of the exact figure, uh, you know, I, I see Freddie Mac fall somewhere in between uh, that number. You know, if we aspire to the 2 million, maybe we'll get to the 1.7 that, uh, that uh, Sam was projecting is necessary. But, um, you know, I think the first thing is policymakers have to realize the gravity and size of this problem. Uh, I think people are uh, beginning to come around to understand that uh, there's no time to lose here. Um, and, you know, the realization that this did not happen overnight, I think, immediately stresses then that it's going to take a while uh, for us to overcome it. So we have to begin now. And there are a number of things we can do, and, and these are, uh, you know, there are going to be things we have to do at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, Sam mentioned um, that we, ha we have some uh, evidence now that what Portland and Minneapolis have done in terms of upzoning can work. Um, and so there are opportunities for the federal government and others to incentivize some more of these zoning um, steps in order to uh, um, lower costs and, and uh, allow for more density. Uh, and also to Sam's point, another point, I mean, these are all points that I think everyone who's been on top of this have been making, and, and we've made this, uh, uh, made some of these same points in our Rosen study, we need a mix of housing types. Uh, so um, alternative dwelling units is, is another idea. Uh, duplexes, which now, you know, we know California will permit in, in formerly single family zone uh, areas and people have jumped on that right away. So uh, the more that can be done to incentivize uh, both the, the loosening of some of these zoning restrictions and a mix of greater housing types would be helpful. Uh, and then also uh, at the National Association of Realtors, we've been advocating some tax policy solutions. So um, we know, for example, that uh, we have a lot of underutilized buildings. Uh, they may be offices, and we've seen that even more so since the pandemic, and that may be the case going into the future. But we've, we've long had a lot of underutilized office space. We've had underutilized malls, um, vacant malls, um, uh, in some cases, vacant school buildings because we've seen drops in birth rates. 
these are opportunities for us to meet this other house, this other important social need, housing. And um, we can provide tax credits for the conversion of some of these properties into housing. Um, we can also provide tax credits to support um, worker training. We, we have a dearth of qualified construction workers. So that's a, another um, thing that we're talking to Congress about. Um, and so I think all of these solutions uh, are part of the mix to helping bring down costs and increase supply. As, as uh, people's work situations change uh, as a outcome of the pandemic, which hopefully will be over uh, sometime soon, uh, there might be less demand for commercial space that could be uh, converted to, to affordable homes. I'm going to just stick with you one more since I, since I owe you one. Um, in, in, in today's housing market, uh, we see a particular, uh, particularly acute shortage of starter homes. It's great today if you own a home, uh, watch the price appreciation, but not so good if you're trying to get into a home uh, for the first time. So how, how concerned is, are the realtors about this segment of the market? And how are you uh, and other industry leaders helping younger borrowers and families climb that first rung on the home ownership ladder? Well, we're very, very concerned. And, you know, again, Sam stressed a, a good point, too, is that we need to make sure that the housing stock we're building uh, is fit for uh, first-time home buyers too. So as, you know, to sort of seg from the other uh, comment, we need to make sure that, you know, we have housing stock that um, is appropriate uh, for first-time home buyers and starter homes. But beyond that, um, you know, first-time home buyers in the current market, because of the housing supply shortage, are at a significant disadvantage. Uh, and this is largely because uh, they don't have equity, right? They're starting out. And we've seen um, through our snapshot of home buying uh, this past year that uh, a large chunk of the market are, are people who you know, are buying their second, third homes. Um, and you know, because of the pandemic, many of them are choosing to move. And so they have equity in their homes. Uh, so they have cash. Uh, often uh, to, to you know, buy them straight out or, or to significantly defray uh, their, their mortgages. Uh, and so uh, first time home buyers can't really compete there. Uh, and then if there are bidding wars, you know, even first time home buyers who thought they had a uh, down payment suddenly discover they would need you know, twice as much of a down payment in order to get into that home. Uh, so, so that is a great challenge. And um, you know, it, it's an even more acute challenge for uh, people of color. Uh, so we have this 30-point uh, uh, home ownership uh, gap between African Americans and whites uh, and uh, major gaps um, between Hispanics and Asians and whites. And so uh, we're seeing the impact now of this market on, and how it's exacerbating those gaps. And so I mentioned, you know, the equity folks have had in homes. I mean, African Americans, because of appraisals and uh, exclusion from the market, um, have even less equity. Uh, when we look at 2020 home purchases, um, African American or well, white Americans were twice as likely to have uh, equity from the sale of uh, a previous home to rely on in buying a new home. Um, and then African Americans were three times as likely to be tapping into retirement funds, and Hispanics two times as likely to be tapping into retirement funds to pay for that down payment. So we have to also look at this as we're trying to address the overall um, uh, supply issue as well as uh, the affordability issue. Um, Build Back Better has some proposals that may help. Uh, certainly first generation down payment assistance uh, is a drop in the right direction, but it is only a drop. Uh, there, there are some uh, proposals to deal with these zoning issues, uh, you know, incentives uh, for um, zoning that will allow for more construction and a greater mix of housing types. Um, so these, these are, are, you know, um, I guess, first steps towards these solutions, but we really need more dramatic solutions. Uh, and then likewise, on the affordability side, we need to um, dig in more to identify some things that can be done to close the home ownership gaps. We saw that mm -hmm. HUD recently. Um, uh, acknowledge that uh, special purpose credit programs are uh, a legal 
uh, vehicle that can be pursued. And that's something that you and uh, the Bipartisan um, Policy Center has advocated for. I think that's another important tool. So we really need to cobble together all of our tools uh, in a sustained way and hopefully more dramatic way uh, to begin to make progress on all these fronts. And Brian, Thanks. I just want to build on, on that point a little bit. And in fact, the point that you made, Sam, um, two of you together, uh, just about kind of the overall picture and the issue of keeping Americans stably housed, that includes rental housing. And, yeah. you know, we focused a lot on home ownership. Most first time home buyers are renters before they can afford to buy. They're, they're renting for years and they're saving. And um, the issue of affordable rental housing is really, there was a lot of pent up demand before the, the pandemic. Um, I think it's bubbling over now. I think we're really seeing the fissures. It's going to become a, a full blown crisis, I, I believe. Um, if you look at the numbers, and I think HUD actually analyzed this before COVID, 11 million renters were spending over 50% of their income on rent. Think about that. I mean, you know, I think a stretch is if you're spending 30%. So think about um, how vulnerable they are to economic shocks, how little ability they have to save, to make that down payment, to climb the economic ladder. And, you know, Brian, you're absolutely right. This is more acutely a problem in uh, communities of color um, where there are, you know, more lower income renters as a percentage of the population. So I think it, it, it is absolutely contributing not only to the um, economic gap, but but the racial uh, inequality gap as well. well. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dana, for raising rental housing, because you make a great point that rental housing and home ownership are complementary segments of the same broader housing market. And so that's a great point that you made. So as a former FHA commissioner, you know how critical uh, government-backed financing is to build new multifamily housing. For the non-housers, that means apartment buildings, multifamily, particularly uh, during economic uh, crises. So can you talk a little bit about the role and importance of federal financing programs, and are there any improvements uh, we can make these uh, to these programs to further incentivize new housing development? Well, I think you have to look no further than um, economic and health crises like we've experienced over the last couple of decades during the financial crisis, as well as during the COVID pandemic, um, you know, organizations and, and agencies like the Federal Housing Administration, you know, certainly the FHFA and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have stepped up to uh, provide counter cyclical support to also provide support, I think, for the nation's most vulnerable homeowners and renters. Um, and, you know, if you if you look at what we were able to do at FHA, even before the passage of the first coronavirus um, aid bill, uh, before the passage of the CARES Act, we provided forbearance to um, multifamily property owners in, in order to kind of uh, stabilize the market and to allow them um, you know, some breathing room. Once the CARES Act was passed, HUD then had the money to um, you know, basically channel it to the, the tenants um, themselves through the property owners, those that were experiencing reduced income, they did it very quickly. You know, I think the role of government financing programs, and I'll throw Section 8 in there, you know, as a program aimed at the very low income households um, for rental assistance, it is there to be a social safety net first and foremost. And we've seen that throughout these crises, the financial crisis and the, uh, you know, the current pandemic. Um, also, you know, providing the counter cyclical relief um, is something that I think government does best and government is needed to, to step in in order to do that. Um, you know, FHA really was able to um, provide kind of stability and prevent, um, you know, additional market disruptions in the commercial real estate market following the financial crisis um, of 2008, 2009. You know, everyone was saying, commercial real estate is the next shoe to drop. Uh, that did not happen. I think in part it is due to the role of FHA and, and kind of providing that counter cyclical support. Um, FHA stepped up multifamily production tremendously during that time. It, it, it showed that it could do that. It is doing that again. You know, there's clearly a market need, a need for counter cyclical support to provide affordable housing. 
FHA is once again stepping in there and, um, and you know, providing uh, markets and renters what they need so that we can be able to produce, although more is needed, as Sam noted. Um, and I think there are additional things that, that we can do to, to get the um, machine running a little bit more smoothly and uh, really get those units to market, which is what has to happen. Well, thank you, Dana. Um, let me get Ismail into this conversation. Uh, a big segment of the great work that Mercy Housing does is, is focused on seniors, older adults, uh, and they're meeting their housing needs. You know, the BPC a few years ago wrote a report on health and housing that highlighted the aging of America, that the segment of the population 65 and older is growing and will grow considerably over the next decade. So um, what specific challenges, uh, Ismail, do you face in building and supporting housing that is suitable, suitable for older adults and for the idea of older adults wanting to age in place? Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks, Dennis. And it, you're absolutely right, you know, that to add senior housing to the list of, you know, of challenges that we're facing in the housing market. Um, certainly true, you know, everything that Sam shared about the entry level and the home ownership uh, issues. Uh, but we're seeing, particularly as the boomers, you know, age and hit retirement age, similar pressures on the senior housing market. Um, and we have, a, you know, a couple of challenges there that we're facing as you know, Mercy Housing and other affordable housing developers as we try to meet that need uh, and, and that growing demand. Um, first of all, one of the problems, um, unfortunately, is that you know, our ability to produce more senior housing, affordable senior housing in particular, very dependent on low-income housing tax credits as the underlying uh, subsidy source, right? You know, that equity that we get. And the, that, that's really up to states uh, to prioritize senior housing and their qualified action plans and their QAPs. Um, and, and because of the pandemic and, and the prior housing you know, issues we've had, um, many states are, are really focused on permanent supportive housing um, as, a, as a segment. Um, and and you know, again, rightly so, but that does leave the senior housing uh, dependent on, on the QAP priorities. But that's just, you know, that's just one issue. We're still able to, you know, in many places, uh, add, add affordable um, housing there uh, for targeted for seniors. However, as they age in place in particular, um, and even as they're coming into that retirement age, um, when their income drops off and they're now dependent on their retirement savings, if they have any, um, many seniors are very low income, extremely low income. Um, and so we have a need for rental subsidies um, in order to make the financials work. In, in senior housing targeting the more you know, lower income or very low income seniors. Um, and while the HUD 202 is sort of back to some degree, very meagerly, um, it really, you know, there's still a lack of vouchers um, that we can rely on uh, to provide that rental subsidy. So certainly, you know, one of the answers there, one of the policy priorities, I think, uh, to address many of these housing needs is the availability of universal housing vouchers so that all who need it have access to that subsidy. Um, and those of us who are trying to produce the housing, you know, have the economics in place to make it work. Um, and then the last issue around senior housing, right, is not the housing issue, but the place and location issue. Um, can we get locations that have the services and amenities that seniors need particularly to be able to age in place um, in their home, not have to be um, moved to a nursing home or assisted living? Um, and that means you know, everything from uh, health, healthcare access, food access, being able to live an active lifestyle uh, so they can you know, exercise and take their walks safely um, and securely. Um, so, so those are all things that have to be prioritized, I think, in the planning departments, you know, when we do master planned communities uh, to include senior housing in the mix, um, you know, along with other mixed use uh, opportunities um, and bring those amenities close to walking distance, um, for seniors to live uh, comfortably, safely, um, and independently for as long as possible. And those are things that Mercy Housing is doing um, in, in the you know, 20 plus states that we serve. Well, thank you, Ismail, and thank you for the work that Mercy is doing. The questions are coming in fast and furious uh, from the audience. So let me uh, get, that, get to them and, and open them up to anyone who wishes to respond uh, from YouTube. Juan asks, how much of housing shortage of the housing shortage is caused by zoning policies and opposition by homeowners to build more affordable housing in their neighborhoods? Anybody want to take that on? 
it, it's uh, certainly a, a component of it. And I think one that, you know, we all agree needs to be addressed. It is um, you know, one thing that we we talk about this is this has been noted on a bipartisan basis. Republicans and Democrats have have noted issues with zoning driving up the cost of housing. It also drives up the cost of federal subsidies to provide housing assistance. Uh, so so certainly, you know, I think there are best practices. Um, someone mentioned, I think it was Brian mentioned Minneapolis as an example. Um, they did a very thorough. Uh, um, analysis of kind of what it would take to remove some of the zoning impediments and the impact on housing density. So there are some, you know, really uh, first movers in this space that are really, really good examples. Um, you know, you also have to look at the permitting process. In the state of Texas, permits can, can be issued a lot quicker than, than in the state of California. Um, you know, I think all of these play into, um, you know, the inability to build affordable housing. And there are all things that have to be looked at, land use restrictions, you know, height restrictions, parking minimums, you know, let's talk about all of that. These are all local decisions and they should be in the hands of local communities and, and the families who, who live in those communities. Mm -hmm. However, there's a lot that we can discuss by, by you know, looking at the best practices um, and kind of convening um, state and local governments to discuss the problems. They're very real. And, and I'd argue, uh, as I have, that there are also incentives that the federal government can provide, too. And uh, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, uh, folks have looked at that. I think that more needs to be done. I, I also want to underscore that the word affordable uh, can mean different things in different contexts, too. Um, so if, you know, if you just take out the word affordable, uh, I think what many of us are saying is that building more housing you know, and this could be private market housing, helps make um, housing more affordable because uh, there's increased supply. And so there are people who are opposed to greater density, you know, even if there are comparable housing types uh, for comparable market. Uh, and then there are also people who oppose, you know, housing that is built uh, either with or, or uh, for persons with government assistance. And I think that's a whole other question um, so I think um, we need to acknowledge that just the traditional market housing, uh, we have not been building, and had we been building it, uh, home prices for uh, first-time home buyers and, and consumers generally would be more affordable. But beyond that, we also need other housing types, um, you know, uh, that that uh, inherently would be more affordable for uh, a wider set of consumers. And Dennis, if I could add just sure. two of those housing types that Brian just referenced that aren't getting enough attention and maybe not enough support. Um, one are the accessory dwelling units, um, mm -hmm. which should be you know, more promoted and really need both zoning and building code uh, and permitting support uh, because they're, they're newer products and not always well understood. And you know, they don't have the, the building departments don't have the experience with them to quickly expedite the permitting process. And the other is modular housing which while the factories are getting it down in terms of the, the construction, once you get on site and have to coordinate with building departments, permitting um, and others, uh, that's where we're, we're seeing the hang up um, and costs kind of you know, be uh, reintroduced that were saved in the factory. So mm -hmm. I think supporting more modular and accessory dwelling units would go a long way toward production of, of housing in a really distributed way um, across mm -hmm. neighborhoods. Thank you for that. Let me just ask Sam, I mean, you, in your presentation, you showed that there's a filtering up effect where some of these older units are being bought by higher income people when in the past, as I understood, they were fil filtered down to become more afford affordable to lower income families over time. So to Brian's point, if we just build more supply uh, and to both Ismail and Brian's point with a, a broad variety, should just the increase of supply reverse this filtering up effect where it would sort of change direction, become a filtering down again, effect again? I, I, absolutely. I want to echo, I, I agree with everything Ismail, uh, Dana, and Brian um, uh, uh, said. And, and yes, I, it would have a huge impact on, on home prices more broadly. And I think Brian's point, I think, is really uh, well taken in the sense that I think we should be talking about how it helps contain the run-up in prices for everyone. <laughs> this is not about affordable housing anymore, right? Because the, the lack of affordability is going up and up the income uh, chain. I would argue 
one of the reasons we're not seeing more existing home sales is we're seeing uh, a really uh, pronounced slowdown in trade up activity. So many of the many, there are many, I'm one of them. I live in my first home and I love to trade up, but there isn't enough for me that I'd like to spend on and I could give up my home for the next first time of our day. So there's this chain that I think would that, that would be unleashed if we build uh, more housing. And I think that would benefit, really benefit every, uh, 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 everyone. But I, I think to Brian's point, I think we should talk about this, not just from an affordable perspective, because I think uh, for some, they might get a certain picture in their mind when they think affordable. But this, but what we're talking about here is, I think, uh, housing for all that will that will benefit the entire income distribution. Right, and I want to throw in there also, um, you know, kind of, you know, when people do think about affordable, they think low income, very low. I think there is a lot of naturally occurring affordable that is eighty percent AMI above a hundred percent. You know, you can be making above the area median income and still not afford to live where you're working. Um, and so I think the focus on all types of housing, as well as sort of these categories above what is considered low income or affordable housing, you know, some refer to it as workforce housing. It's almost like the housing, whether it's home ownership or rental housing for the missing middle, that is an important component. And I don't think you can address affordable housing period, unless you look at that, uh, that segment of the market. And, and if I may make a quick a po a po a point, Dennis, mm -hmm. uh, related to Dana's comment, we haven't talked about transportation at all, but there's a strong linkage between housing and transportation. And so I think, you know, what, one of the issues with the lack of affordability is more and more people live further and further away from their jobs, which means they're much more dependent on transportation. They spend more on energy, so they become exposed to um, energy costs. And moreover, it's worse for the environment. So there are many, I think, you know, sort of uh, downstream benefits that can happen in, in, in a variety of adjacent industries if, if we had uh, more. And, and as, we talk, as we talk about converting hotels and malls and uh, places, I mean, I think to have uh, the ability to create more multifamily housing doesn't have to be big necessarily. Um, they, don't, they don't have to be big developments, but to create more multifamily housing uh, in different communities that can be workforce housing um, would help fill that gap. And we, we can do that with some of this um, underutilized uh, commercial space. We're, we're running out of time, but I need to ask this question because it's really, we haven't touched on it yet. It's from YouTube, but James asks, how do we address funding for truly rural areas that also need affordable housing uh, for entry level and, and senior markets? Anybody have any thoughts? This is a very important segment, is rural housing, where People do struggle with their housing needs and affordability in rural communities. So anybody want to take that on? I can certainly share, you know, from our experience in, in states around the country, you know, including uh, Illinois, um, you know, we've had properties in Iowa, Nebraska, that the, the challenge in, in many of those communities is rents are so low, right, that the economics of building um, rental housing, multifamily housing don't really work. And so the, the low income housing tax credit ultimately is what we have to lean on and rely on. And so it points to that need, uh, the policy priority of increasing the availability of low income housing tax credits. Um, we know that even today they're oversubscribed substantially. And that puts the rural communities at a disadvantage when they're competing you know, on a small rural deal versus a larger urban uh, affordable housing development. So the states need enough, the resources to be able to target, prioritize rural small community housing. Um, and, and I think that points to a federal policy priority around increasing the, the low income housing tax credit program. And Ishmael, I think you made a, a very good point earlier when you referred to the role of manufactured and modular housing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we all need to, when we have a discussion on creating more uh, housing supply, we have to kind of come and drop our biases. And I think a lot of folks have biases on manufactured housing, modular, you know, a lot of the, the housing that is built in factories um, very much resembles stick built housing. And you know it, the, the technology and the innovation that they're able to kind of put into it in order to provide a substantially um, you know, reduced in terms of cost um, house, especially for rural communities. And I think, I think manufactured housing is responsible for 10 to 15% of affordable housing in America. This is a very important category. It's one that is you know, every day seeing more and more innovation. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. 
Well, thank you. We're, we're, we're out of time. I just want to thank uh, you, Sam, for your presentation. I want to thank uh, the panelists for their contributions. This was a really fascinating uh, conversation, and I hope we have helped together collectively to shine the spotlight on the need for more housing supply uh, in the United States. And as I mentioned at the outset of today's program, this is just the first in a series of events that the BPC's J. Ronald J. Ronald Twilliger Center for Housing Policy uh, is planning to host in the coming months, exploring barriers to building more housing and how to overcome them. And I wanna uh, to tell the audience to please be sure to mark your calendars for January 8th, 18th, excuse me, uh, the date of our next webinar, uh, which will focus on addressing overly restrictive land use and zoning barriers to new housing uh, development. And with that, I want to thank everyone who took an hour of their lives uh, to tune in uh, this afternoon. And from all of us at BPC, we wish you a very happy holiday season and look forward to seeing you uh, next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.